This is lecture three, where we're going to talk about the Fourier series. So a little bit of feedback from uh, the previous week. Um, a couple of students have commented that the um, slides, the PowerPoints, don't contain enough information to answer all the questions and have asked whether we can add additional material. And that is possible, but that's not the way this module runs. So the lectures only cover the facts you need. So the, the lectures are fairly minimal. But the way we actually learn in this module is through solving problems. So that's why we have so many problem classes. That's why we have weekly problem classes, then we have the problem sheets, and we have the cahoots, and then I give you the practice tests, and then we have the fortnightly class tests. It's because the way to actually learn signals is to, to go through the work. I could, I could give you two hours worth of lectures per week, but it wouldn't help you. It would just be a greater burden and additional material for you. So no, my, my lecture uh, notes are deliberately scaled down. They're fairly minimal. They cover what you need to understand the concepts with a couple of examples. But you'll actually learn how to learn the, the deeper concepts by wider reading and by solving the problems. So where are we? We're now in week three. And we've finished talking about signal classification, correlation, convolution, and we spoke about the elementary functions, the uh, unit impulse ramp, and um, a step. Now, this is our first step into um, the world of the Fourier transform, or let's call it the um, frequency domain. So we're going to spend a week talking about the Fourier series, a week talking about the Fourier transform, and then we're going to talk about the, four, the properties of the Fourier transform. So three weeks talking about uh, Fourier. Okay, then we're going to spend one week talking about um, discrete time signals and sampling. Then we're going to start talking about systems. So where are we in the um, in the uh, schedule? We are now in week three this is what we're doing right now we're going to have a problem class on monday the 26th of october and you're going to have a class test or let's call it a home test on the following monday on the 2nd of november okay that class test will include the uh, contents from lectures two and three. So a quick recap. When we spoke about elementary functions, both last week and the week before, we introduced correlation, autocorrelation, cross-correlation. We spoke about how they're used, why they're used. And we spoke about convolution. We spoke about how this is going to be really important because we'll be using it a lot in this module. We introduced the sifting property of the uh, delta Dirac function, and we solved a lot of problems about that in problem sheet uh, two. Okay, um, you've already had class test one, you've had a little bit of feedback on that. Um, so now what we need to do is learn a few new things, build up our knowledge, practice that, um, answer a load of questions, and prepare for the next class test. So our next class test is on Monday, the 2nd of November. Today, what we're going to talk about is the Fourier series. So what we're, every, everything we talk about today, that includes the words Fourier, is about spectral representation. That is representing a signal in frequency. So instead of repre uh, representing a signal as a function of time, we can represent it as a function of frequency. So this is our signal as a function of time, and this is our uh, signal 
as a function of frequency. And what we want to do is convert from one representation to the other. So, everything we mentioned today is about a class of signal that we call periodic, and we introduced these in the first uh, lecture. So, a periodic signal is a signal that repeats itself. Okay, so any signal that... So, let's look at the red signal here. So, this red signal here repeats itself after some period t. So, we call that a periodic waveform. The question we're going to answer is, can such a waveform, can a periodic waveform, be represented using other periodic waveforms? In this case, sinusoids. So can I use sine waves to represent a periodic waveform? This is the question we're going to try to answer today. Um, just as a spoiler, the answer is yes. And that's exactly what um, Joseph Fourier uh, did for us. So that's what the Fourier transform or the Fourier series is all about. So, this strange representation in three dimensions, don't worry, you won't be using this. You won't be seeing it again. I might present it one more time just to illustrate something. But what I'm trying to do in this representation is to nudge you to shift your perspective from a perspective in the time domain to a perspective in the frequency domain. Okay, So instead of looking at the signal from this direction, I want you to look at a signal from this direction. So what does that mean? Let's look at this signal in red. Okay, let's look at this signal. It's a periodic signal, and here, in this direction, we have the time axis. Behind it, what you have is lots of sine waves. So these are all sinusoids. When I say sinusoid, I include cosines. So what we have is a whole load of sinusoids, and if I add them up, I end up with this periodic waveform here. So all of these are being added up. And if you look from the side, if you look at these bars here, these represent the amplitude of these sine waves. So that's the amplitude of that sine wave, that's the amplitude of that sine wave, that's the amplitude of that, etc. So when we talk about a spectrum, this is what we mean. This is our spectrum. It's a representation, it's a diagram that shows you the amplitudes of the frequencies, or the amplitudes of the spectral components, the amplitudes of the sine waves that add up to make our periodic signal. So these two views, whether it's the red um, or the blue, they represent the same signal. So these are the same signal. They're just two re representations. This is in time. And this is in frequency. And we can move between one representation to the other. Sometimes one is more useful than the other. So this is just to give you an overview. Don't worry too much about this diagram. It's only here to make, um, uh, to make this make more sense. If it doesn't, if this diagram has failed, if it, it isn't making much sense, don't worry about it. So, this is a single sine wave, right? That's a sine wave in the time domain. If we wanted to, to express that sine wave mathematically, we would say something like x of t 
is a sine omega t. So the two things that represent the sine wave are the amplitude a and the frequency omega. So as all we have is two numbers, we can represent those two numbers on a different kind of uh, graph. So I can represent these two numbers right here. I can say, well, here is my amplitude and here is my frequency. So I can put my a here and my omega there. So you can see that these two graphs, these two representations, are different ways of looking at the same thing. So essentially, they're the same. They both represent a sine wave. But one is representing the variation in time, and one is representing the variation in frequency. Now, for a periodic signal, we're going to use the word fundamental to describe the frequency. Simply because this frequency, the frequency axis, is variable. There's lots of frequencies. So to represent this specific frequency, we use the word fundamental frequency. And instead of using omega, we're going to use omega naught. Instead of f, we're going to use f naught just to make it clear that we're talking about the frequency of this particular sinusoid. Now, when we talk about frequency analysis, what we're talking about is breaking down our signal into its constituent components. So representing our sine wave as a sum of components. So here we have a periodic waveform. Right? This is really important. Everything we talk about in today's lecture is periodic. Here we have sine waves. And what we're saying is if we add these sine waves together, we're going to get this periodic waveform. And that's what we call synthesis. Synthesis is taking our uh, sine waves adding them together to form a periodic waveform. Analysis is the opposite. It's taking our, free, our periodic waveform and breaking it down to represent it as individual components, individual pure sine waves. Now, what's the fundamental frequency? The fundamental frequency is always 1 over the fundamental period, which we can call t naught, or you can just call t. And the frequency in radians per second is the same multiplied by 2 pi. So these are both representations of frequency. We will tend to use this when we talk about Fourier transform, and this when we talk about um, Fourier series, but you'll find sometimes they're interchangeable. Okay, Just remember that we have this factor of 2 pi. So, this time, what we're going to do, instead of representing our periodic waveform as um, as a sum of sine waves, we're going to do that using a different illustration, using that frequency domain representation I introduced in that 3D diagram a few slides ago. So instead of saying that this is equal to a big sine wave with a low frequency plus a little sine wave with a high frequency, we're going to do the same thing using this diagram. So this is the big sine wave with a low frequency, and this is the smaller sine wave with a higher frequency. And this is what we call a spectral representation. So the position of these bars or these impulses on the frequency axis, that represents the uh, frequency.
So we have a time domain view and a frequency domain view. Remember we said the fundamental frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So F0 is 1 over T. That fundamental frequency is, oops, that fundamental frequency is that frequency there. And that's the lowest part of the spectrum. So there's nothing else going on before the fundamental frequency. All right? So the lowest um, part, the lowest frequency component in a signal is the fundamental. So nothing before F0. There's nothing going on there. Now this just happens to be the sixth harmonic. That means that it has a frequency of six times the fundamental. So if we go back to here, that means this signal has a frequency of six times this signal. So that means whatever we have here, if this was 100, this would be 600. So as an example, we're going to solve a very similar example in the problem sheet. But as an example, if you have a um, series of rectangular pulses, is it a periodic signal? Yes, therefore we can use the Fourier transform, a Fourier series. The Fourier series is, we'd have a frequency axis, we'd have a fundamental frequency, and here what you have is harmonics. So these are higher harmonics. Higher meaning greater than one. So this is the fundamental. The fundamental um, we sometimes call the first harmonic fundamental equals the first harmonic. All right, so that is this. This is the fundamental or the first harmonic. And these are higher harmonics. These are different harmonics. In this case, it just happens that we have the third, fifth, seventh, etc. So that means if I have a sine wave of this frequency and this amplitude plus a sine wave of this frequency, that means three times the fundamental and this amplitude, plus another and another and another, all the way to infinity, I can represent, I can recreate this periodic pulse train perfectly. That's if I had an infinite number of sine waves. In practice, that's not possible. So, just to represent, uh, represent that in different language, if you have a periodic waveform, like this, why do I call it periodic? Well, because even though it might look a little bit messy, if the signal repeats itself, then it's periodic. That means I can represent it using these sine waves. Sine waves are just harmonics. That means they are multiples of the fundamental. So this is my fundamental. The fundamental is just a pure sine wave with a frequency equal to that of the... Um, or a fundamental frequency equal to that of the signal. So that is the same. That's why we call it the fundamental. So if this has a frequency F0 is 1 over T, this will have a frequency maybe of 2 F0. This might have a frequency of 3 F0. This will have a frequency of 4 F0. So together, we call these the harmonics. All right. 
And sometimes we use the word higher harmonics just to um, distinguish between the fundamental, which is also called the first harmonic. So when we say a weighted sum, it means we add them together, but they don't all have the same amplitude. So you can see some of them have a greater amplitude. And remember, we already spoke about synthesis versus analysis. So synthesis is taking our sine waves to create a periodic waveform, and analysis is taking our waveform to and breaking it down into its individual components. And again, the weighted sum is all about the amplitude. So this amplitude isn't the same as that amplitude, isn't the same as this. So each one has a unique amplitude. And we need to add these together with the right weightings, so with the right, right amplitudes, in order to recreate our function. So if I wanted to, to try to represent that mathematically, I might say x of t equals sine omega naught t, that's my fundamental, plus sine 2 omega naught t, plus sine 3 omega naught t, etc. But that doesn't say anything about the amplitude. I mean, it's clear that that's the fundamental, and that's twice the fundamental, that's three times the fundamental, but what goes in here? And what goes in here? And what goes in here? The answer is, well, these are these amplitudes. And it's these amplitudes, the coefficients of the signs, which this lecture is all about. It's how to calculate those amplitudes. So you'll see that we're going to call these amplitudes the A and the B coefficients for the sine and the cosine coefficients. And you'll see exactly how we're going to calculate those in a minute. So again, one of these weird um, three-dimensional plots where we have a, a time axis and a frequency axis. And it's basically the same thing. I'm trying to show you how this... Um, square wave here, or this wave that looks almost like a square wave, can be represented by adding all of these components here. So how many components are we um, actually adding here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we were to add those six harmonically related um, sine waves, we would end up with this um, blue signal there. If we had an infinite number of, um, si of, of sine waves to add, if I could add more of these to infinity, our s uh, blue wave would look more like a perfect square wave. But in practice, we don't have an infinite number of frequencies. In practice, we're limited by the bandwidth of whatever medium we're using. So in real life, we're limited. That's why in real life, we never get these square waves. So this is what we end up with. If, for example, we only had um, three components, that's one, two, three. If we only had those three components, look at the result. The result isn't very good. If that was supposed to be a square wave, then it's not very good. It sort of looks squarish, but look at look at those ripples. So that that's that's a distortion brought about by the fact that we have a limited bandwidth. So all this frequency from here all the way to infinity is not available to us. The only th frequencies that are available are these. So using three 
harmonics. The first harmonic, the second harmonic, and the third harmonic, that's the best we could recreate. This creates a form of distortion we refer to as Gibbs phenomenon. The fact that whatever we do, we can never have a perfect square wave. Whatever we do, we're always going to have this overshoot here. Even if we had a very large number of uh, harmonics, even if we had a very large bandwidth, very large um, frequency availability, we still wouldn't be able to eliminate that totally. Here's an example. Because it's common, we'll, we often come across the periodic pulse train. And again, this is going to be, um, we'll go into this in much more detail in the problem sheet. But this, I showed you this same example before, and I showed you how we would have our fundamental and our harmonics. Sometimes the shape of the spectrum actually follows some kind of an envelope i.e. some kind of an outline. And we can find that mathematically. Okay, so remember we said uh, today's lecture is about finding these amplitudes. It's not enough just to know what the fundamental frequency is, because the fundamental frequency is just 1 over t. And the um, harmonics are just multiples of that. The clever bit is finding these amplitudes. All right, so these are the A and the B coefficients. These are the coefficients of the sines and the cosines. So in this case, for this example, all I wanted to do was to illustrate that uh, the shape of the spectrum depends not only on T, because T will determine um, the fundamental frequency, but it will also depend on tau or the pulse width, because, you know, tau isn't the same as t. You know, tau here is less than t. So tau will determine these points here, these zero crossings, okay? You don't necessarily need to know that, but if you were to solve this and to actually find these amplitudes and to find this envelope, you would find that the width of the pulse actually changes the positions of these zero crossings. Now, you will soon um, be doing experiment three. Okay, so those of you in Liverpool will be doing this um, on iPads in the lab. Um, and you're able to actually download the app for this um, from the App Store. Okay, it's only available on iOS. This was developed in the department. So this is a University of Liverpool um, app. Paul Watkinson is now retired, but he, uh, he was one of the uh, technicians in our lab. And he... Um, worked on developing lots of the, the software and the hardware that you're using today. So this app is available, and this is what we'll be using for experiment three. I had created a little demonstration of that in a little video. I won't play that for you, um, but you, you can either download it yourself or play it um, yourself from the PowerPoint. What I did want to show you, however, was this little applet. So there, there are several um, available, but there's this little uh, applet, and if you follow that link there, it'll give you a nice little interactive um, applet to show you how Fourier analysis and synthesis works. So here we have a, a sawtooth waveform. Let's change that to a square wave because that's what we were talking about um, earlier. So that's your square wave. Now notice what you have beneath that is the signs. So these are the signs. And if you look at the amplitudes, this is the amplitude. I, you, I, I can change that just by um, moving that up and down. This is the actual 
amplitude of the first compo uh, harmonic. This is the third harmonic. This is the second harmonic. So if you change the amplitudes of the harmonics and you add these harmonics together, that will change the signal that you're looking at. And we're able actually to... <laughs> not very pleasant but the point is that every audio tone is determined by the shape of the uh, spectrum and the fundamental frequency so let me just quickly um, show you again I'll put the volume down show you how this would change if I were to change the frequency <laughs> something for you to um, uh, to play around with and uh, to, to, to appreciate how these sines and cosines so I was just looking at the signs because of the size of my screen so um, we were looking at this part but actually the bottom part of the screen included um, the cosines as well so that's something for you to uh, to have a look at sorry next slide so I, I promised you I wouldn't dwell on this um, graphic for long, but I'm, I bring it up occasionally just to, uh, to make a point. So we keep talking about sinusoids, but what are we talking about? Are we talking about sines or cosines? And what's the difference between a sine and a cosine? The main difference for the purposes of this lecture is that sines are odd and cosines are even. Remember in lecture one we spoke about odd and even functions? Well, this is where we're going to use it. A sine function is odd and a cosine is even. Meaning that sines are odd, meaning that the function of minus x equals minus the function of x. In an even function, the function of minus x is equal to the function of x. Now if we use t instead of x, an even function you would say x of t equals x of minus t. And for an odd function, x of t equals minus x of minus t. All right, so we could use examples for that. You would say, for example, you know, cosine uh, t equals cosine minus t. And for an odd function, you'd say sine t equals minus sine minus t. Or a nicer way of writing that, or a more familiar way, probably, is saying sine minus t equals minus sine t. You can check that using a calculator or put in any numbers uh, you wish. But the important thing is to know that cosines are even and signs are odd. Now, do all functions have to be odd or even? No. So this function is neither odd nor even. So, we have cosines are even, so we have something called the Fourier cosine series, and that applies to even functions. So, here we can represent a function f of t as a summation of lots of cosines. What does that actually mean, n omega t? That just means, so omega naught, that's just um, 2 pi times f naught, which is 1 over t. So here we have n from 1 to infinity. So that just means, you know, cosine omega naught t plus cosine 2 omega naught t plus cosine 3 
omega naught t plus etc. And the, the, the clever bit really is this bit here. What's going on here? What's the coefficient? And the coefficient is this thing that we're calling a. So we have a naught, a1, a2, etc. So this is the clever bit. This is the weighting coefficient. So we call this the cosine series, or the Fourier cosine series. And it's only for even functions. We can do the same for odd functions. So if we had an even function, sorry, an odd function, we can use um, sines. And the sines, exactly the same. This time we're going to be finding bn. So an even function can be represented by the summation of even or of uh, cosines, and an odd function can be represented as a summation of sines. And if a function is neither odd nor even, then we use both sines and cosines. So this is our general arbitrary periodic functions. It's not for all functions, it's only for periodic functions. And when we say arbitrary, one thing I mean by that is that it can be even, odd, or neither. So that's why we have the cosine bit, the even series. We have the sine bit for the odd series. But we also have this other bit, this extra bit. And that's what we call the DC component. So remember, a signal can be even, it can be odd. So let, let's say we had an, a periodic function that looked like this. That's clearly, well, maybe not clearly, but this is an odd function, the way I've drawn it. This is an odd function. But it's possible to have the same function but with an offset. Okay, so if we had a clamping circuit that added DC, then we'd have an offset. But we'd still treat it, it isn't an odd function anymore, but we can treat it as an odd function. But what we would have to be wary of is this DC term. So this is the most important um, formula in this um, in this lecture. It's called the Fourier series, where any signal f of t, as long as it's periodic, can be represented using a bunch of sines and cosines. When I say a bunch, I mean an infinite series, an infinite number of cosines and an infinite number of sines. Okay, it might not be clear, but there is a summation here. So even if we don't include that summation, even if we don't write it, this summation is the same as that summation. They're both included. Now, remember we said the clever bit is actually finding these components, actually knowing what these amplitudes are. Remember we said these are all sine waves with different amplitudes. It's these amplitudes which we're trying to find. So the actual clever bit isn't, isn't this. That's just um, almost um, intuitive now. The clever bit is how we're going to actually find these components. And what Joseph Fourier said is that we can find these components by calculating the integral of the product of our function f of t, which is the same as that, multiplied by the cosine 
or the sine of, of that particular harmonic frequency. With the exception of the DC component, which is simply the average, it's simply the integral over one period of the function. So notice all of these are integrated over one period. What if there's no period? What if it's not periodic? What if the signal isn't periodic? Well, we said the signal has to be periodic. So if the signal wasn't periodic, you can't do any of this. The Fourier series only applies to periodic signals for which there is a fundamental period. So just remember that all of these have a 2, except a naught doesn't. So watch out for that. So that was a general representation, the so-called trigonometric representation of the Fourier series. So this is the trigonometric representation of the Fourier series. What we can do is combine the A's and the B's into a single C, and then instead of having a sine and a cosine, we can represent them using a cosine. But we have to have this phase shift here representing the inverse tan of B over A. Okay, so we're not going to use this much, but it's useful for spectral representations. It's useful for diagrams. Now, you should know that if you have a sine wave of amplitude A, then the power of the sine wave, that is the mean square value, oops, sorry, the power is equal to A squared over 2. So if we have a cosine with an amplitude of Cn, then the power of that cosine is Cn squared over 2. And it's the same here. The power of the um, cosine here would be A squared over 2. And the same here. It would be Bn squared over 2. So, now we've introduced this um, um, compact harmonic representation with the C's instead of the A's and the B's. It allows us to, rather than having two sketches, a sine sketch or a sine spectrum and a cosine spectrum, we can combine it into a single um, uh, frequency a representation where we have the fundamental and we have the harmonics. Now, because this is discrete in frequency, why do we call it discrete? Remember what we said: discrete time signals is a signal which is only defined at key instances in time. The same here. So we have nothing going on from zero to the fundamental. We have no components between these spectral components. So we call this discrete in frequency. So because it's discrete, we don't need to use the continuous version of the Dirac function. So even though sometimes we use an arrow, what we need, mean is a discrete form of the delta Dirac function. And so even though we often use omega or f, what we can do is simply use n. So we could just say 0. Sorry, not 0. Um, how do I rub that out? So, yeah. What I meant to say was... 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 
identify. So both representations are okay. So you can represent a Fourier series using f, an f naught, omega, an omega naught, or n. The only thing I've added in this representation here is this component here. This is our DC term. This is the average term. Remember we said if we had a clamping circuit and our signal was raised by some value, this is my A0. That's my DC shift. So the DC is A0. So A0, which happens to equal C0, that's your DC shift. That is your first component there. It's not the first harmonic, it's the first component. It's the DC term. So you'll always find a DC term at n equals zero. So where have we seen this before? Where have you seen some kind of representation like this? Now, I, I show you these uh, LED uh, spectrum visualizers simply because it's something you might have come across before. And it, it's interesting because if, let me, um, yeah. So spectrum representation where you have frequency on the um, horizontal axis and amplitude on the vertical axis, that is a spectral representation. And same here. I mean, here you might have F0, 2F0, 3F0. Not quite, because obviously this is for periodic waveforms, and um, what I'm drawing isn't necessarily a periodic waveform. But let's imagine that the music that's being represented is periodic. Then what we have here is a... Um, a, a, a physical representation of the Fourier series. And it's an interesting um, home project, or you could, you could do this as a, a, um, a year two project, if you like, build your own spectral uh, visual analyzer. So in the PowerPoint, these are actually clickable, but on my iPad, I can't click it. But what I can do is show you, um, show you, how this looks. So let me. So here you can see the horizontal axis is frequency. So what's happening is that in time, the contributions of the different frequency components are changing. So you're having more or less higher frequency components uh, changing with time. That's why the, the display isn't static, it's, it's changing. Um, let me show you another. So there's a, there are some really nice ones here. Um, all of these, look at them, they're sort of homemade DIY sexual visual so Again, here you have. DC, first harmonic on the left, and then as you go towards the right, you have your, sorry, DC is the zeroth harmonic, and then you have the first harmonic on the second So this little video, I'm not going to show it to you, um, you can watch it on your own, but he goes through the, 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 the steps of actually making this. Builds it together, connects it with an app on his phone. As he plays the music, he can control the lighting. So whenever you see a spectral analyzer, what you're actually seeing is a spectral representation. It's a four-dimensional, well, a three-dimensional um, uh, Fourier series. Why do I say three dimensions? Because you've got... You know, one dimension is the frequency, one dimension is the amplitude, and the um, third dimension is time. Because as you watch it, these things go up and down, don't they? So these, th these, um, uh, these bars are being lit, and they go up and down, up and down with time. So that's a, a three-dimensional representation. So that's a spectrum. 
spectrum analyzer, what, what you also might see is something called a, um, a graphic equalizer. Um, so a graphic equalizer isn't the same. So what, what, what these do, this, this is obviously a software graphic equalizer on older hi-fi units. You might have physical buttons and um, dials. So these would actually be knobs that you can move up and down. So what, what's actually happening here is the opposite. What, what you're doing is you're amplifying different components. So in a graphic equalizer, if you wanted to um, have less uh, bass, you would bring these down to attenuate, to reduce the amplification of bass. If you wanted um, to uh, increase the treble, to increase the higher frequencies, you would increase that. So depending on the quality of what you're listening to, or the nature of it, is it music, is it voice, what kind of music is it, um, what kind of audio system do you have, you know, how good your hearing is, you might want to um, move these up or down. So that's a, a graphic equalizer. I'm, I'm trying to link the idea of a graphic equalizer with the idea of a spectrum. So it could be that, for example, if um, you have very low um, uh, high frequency components, so there's not much high frequency components, you might want to amplify that if you want to hear those components more clearly. Or it could be the other way around. So um, when, you, when you deal with something called an equalizer, you're actually dealing with a spectrum and you're amplifying components of it. So this is, to give you some context, not directly important for this module. So where were we? We were talking about even and odd components and we started talking about how we can represent this as a summation of your A components for the even, your B components for the odd, and a DC term. So this is something we really need um, to keep in mind. We're going to be using this uh, quite often. And remember I said the clever bit isn't that. The clever bit is how are we going to calculate A0, AN, and BN. And we're going to go through a um, quick example, or maybe not a quick example, but we're going to go through an example of how to do that. So just to be clear, when we have an even function, we only use even components. And by even components, what I mean is cosine components. So therefore, we're not going to have any sine components. And if we have an odd function, then we would use the sine components, which are odd, and we wouldn't use any even components. And if a signal has no DC value, if it's symmetric about the um, time axis, so if I had a, sorry, the, um, yeah, symmetric about the time axis, if I had a signal like this, where the average value is zero, so if you were to integrate over one period, the average value would be zero, then a naught would be zero. So these are some shortcuts we can use. I just need to, to make a, one thing clear, is that if a signal is even, that doesn't mean n has to be even. So if, if a signal is even or a signal is odd, n can be even or odd. So it doesn't affect n. Because remember, the summation is from 1 to infinity. It's not only even numbers or only odd numbers. It's all, num all uh, num integers from 1 to infinity. Now, it could, be, it could be that for a particular waveform like this, we're only going to have um, the odd components. That, that might be the case. Or it could be only the even components. 
or it could be um, some other uh, pattern. But that, that doesn't matter. That's not the point we're making here. What we're saying here is that when we have an even function, we don't need to calculate the b's because they're going to be zero. And if we have an odd function, we don't need to calculate the a's because the a's are going to be zero. And if a signal has no average, no DC value, then we don't need to calculate a naught because a naught is zero. Okay, so that's, that's the, the point of this slide. Now, this is the final part of today's lecture. I know it's almost uh, an hour I've been talking. But we're going to go through an example. It's a, quite a long example, but here we have some sawtooth signal. And the question is, find this Fourier series representation. That means, when I say find the Fourier series representation, that means represent it as x of t equals a naught plus summation of a n cosine plus summation of b n sine. That's what it means. So the question is actually saying, find a naught, find a n, find b n, find omega naught, because, you know, we, we, there's that there, isn't there? Or um, actually it's um, n omega t. So the question also implies find omega naught. Then write it like that. So I'll take you through the steps. The first step is we need to check whether this is a periodic signal. All right? If it isn't a periodic signal, we can't do all of this. So the first thing is check if it's a periodic signal. If it's a peri periodic signal, we need to find the period, and then that gives us omega naught. So the period is just the reciprocal of this time here. So in this case, from minus t over 2 to t over 2, that's t. So the, um, the um, fundamental frequency omega naught is 1 over t. Then we need to ask ourselves, is it even or is it odd? Because that will determine whether we're finding the a's or we're finding the b's. Final step, we need to write it like that. So it's a six-step process. So let's go through it step by step. First, what's the period? Well, we just said it's um, t, because it's t over 2 minus minus t over 2. So we can find the fundamental frequency. If you want, you could say um, and f naught equals 1 over t. Same thing, but we're going to be using omega naught in our, um, in our uh, expression. So we're going to be using n omega naught. So it makes sense to find omega naught. Second, is it an even or is it an odd function? So look at it. Is it symmetric about, the, um, about zero? Here we have x of t. Here we have x of, let's call it minus t. And you can see that it's symmetric both ways. In other words, if I want to write it the way we wrote the definition, I can say x of minus t equals minus x of t. Or really simplistically, you can say, well, it looks like a sine wave. All right, so a sine wave would do that. So it looks like a sine wave. You can think of it like that, or you can apply this criterion. Either way, it's clearly odd. So because it's an odd function, we're going to be using the b's. Because remember, we have a's. These are for the cosine. The b's are for the sine. So because it's odd, we're going to be using the b's. And we're not going to be using the a's. So in other words, a n equals zero. All the a's are zero. All the a's are zero. So remember we had six steps. We've just cancelled 
Step four, because we know all the a's are equal to zero. So a n equals zero. We don't need to spend five minutes calculating a n. Step three was to find the DC term. The DC term, remember the definition, is just the average. So it's 1 over t integral from 0 to t x of t dt. So we need to find some expression for x of t. So it's a straight line. You can find the gradient of that straight line. But you can look at it and say, well, this area and this area, they're the same. So you can save yourself some time and say, well, there's no DC value, and the average is therefore equal to 0, and A0 is equal to 0. Now, could we have skipped that step altogether? Well, yes, because we already established, just in the previous slide, that because this is an odd function, a n equals 0. So we could have just said, well, a naught equals 0 as well, because it's, not, it's clearly um, odd and it has no DC value. So we've almost finished. If we go back to our six steps, it looks like a lot of work. But we found the period. It took us 30 seconds. Even or odd, it took us 30 seconds. A naught took us even less. Um, we already figured out that all the ANs are zero. So here, that's zero, that's zero, that's odd, and that's one over t. So really, all we have to do now is find the B coefficients. So we just need to find these values here because that's what the B coefficients are. So that's our final step. So that's what's going to take a little bit of time, actually. So that's our A0. Next step, um, oh, we, we already established that's 0. So this is finding Bn. So this is our final step. How are we going to find Bn? Well, remember the... Uh, the formula we, uh, we introduced, we said Bn is the integral of our signal x of t multiplied by the, um, uh, the harmonic, the odd harmonic sign, over one period multiplied by 2 over t. So we need to find an expression for this, and it's a straight line, and if you find the gradient of this uh, line, let me just zoom in here. You can find the gradient because that there is A and that's T over 2. So the gradient is A divided by T over 2. So therefore, you can write that as 2A over T times your independent variable T. So now our problem becomes an integration problem. If you take all the constants out, our problem becomes what's the integral of t sine n omega naught t? And that is an integration problem. You can use integration tables or you can use integration by parts. And um, looks messier than it is. It's actually simply two terms. It's literally just two terms. The tricky bit is putting the limits of your integration in. So if you put your limits in, you end up with this monstrosity there. And then you can simplify that because if you notice, what you have is multiples of pi. If you look carefully, so these t's will cancel. These twos will cancel. What you have is cosine n pi. These t's will cancel. These twos will cancel. Sine n pi. Right. So 
it's not as messy as it looks. So if you remember that cosine m pi is just minus 1 to the power n, and sine n pi is always 0, why is that? Well, sine n pi, that's the easy one, sine n pi. Remember, n is an integer, so sine t at integer um, multiples of pi will be 0. So sine n pi is always 0 because n is an integer. And cosine n pi is either 1 or minus 1. And again, you can remind yourself of that because the cosine looks like that. And here you've got pi, here you've got 2 pi, 3 pi, minus pi. So again, it's either minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, etc. So it's like minus 1 to the power n. So if n is equal to 1, you would have minus 1 to the power 1. If n is equal to 2, you'd have minus 1 to the power 2. So you can replace these expressions with either 0 or minus 1 to the power n. And that gives us this nicer expression, which you can again simplify a little bit more by combining these minus signs, and it gives you this nicer expression. So is this correct? Yes, that's correct. It's just not a very neat way of representing it. This is much neater, easier to calculate, and um, this is what we would expect you to actually use as your b coefficient. So now we've found b of n. That doesn't mean we found b1 or b2 or b3. We've just found an expression between b and n. So for any value of n, we can find b. So now I can represent my final answer like this. So this is how we want it. We want it as a Fourier series. It just happens that a naught is 0, B, B N, uh, a n is 0, so we don't need to mention these bits. So all we're mentioning is that bit. And this here, this is my B n. So we need to still include the sign bit, but I need to replace omega naught with what we calculated it as. So f is 1 over t, omega naught is 1 over, or 2 pi over t. If I just go back a second, I think I, here, yeah, I, what I should have said here, I apologize, was 2 pi over t. So 1 over t, that's f naught. Omega naught is 2 pi over t, sorry. So this is our final answer. x of t is a summation of this expression as a coefficient, and that is my odd components. Now, from this, it's possible to find um, b1, it's possible to find b2, it's possible to find b3, and that might be useful if I wanted to actually sketch what this looks like. I want to, if I wanted to sketch my spectrum and make it look like the spectrum that we had uh, before in the app, that would be useful. We can actually calculate this just by um, putting the value of 1 in here 
and then putting the value of 2, then putting the value of 3, it might be useful. But for this question, all it wants is an expression, and an expression that um, what I've highlighted in the, in the yellow box should be enough. So, just to recap, we have introduced the Fourier series as a way to represent periodic signals as an infinite summation of sines and cosines. We've made a distinction between synthesis and analysis, and we've spoken about how signals can be represented. So the spectral representation is the 2D representation. It's the, the, the uh, discrete frequency um, plot where we have omega or n on the horizontal axis and the amplitude on the vertical axis. So on Monday, there will be a problem class. And the next problem sheet should be available to you already. So just as a reminder, you have a test coming up on the 2nd of November. So make sure you're ready for that. OK. And there will be a practice test before that. So that is Fourier series complete. Next stop, Fourier transform. I'm going to spend two weeks talking about the Fourier transform. Now, Fourier transform is exactly the same, except we're no longer looking at periodic signals. We're going to be looking at signals that are periodic and non-periodic. So we're going to look at arbitrary signals, signals which aren't necessarily periodic. OK, so that's the end of today's lecture. I hope you found it uh, helpful. I will see you uh, at our next problem class. And until then, stay safe.